Dear NBUS members and participants, dear partners, the Norwegian Embassy in Singapore and Innovation Norway, a very warm welcome to today's important panel discussion. As Martin Luther King once says, we may all come on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. The world is now more collectively aware of the responsibility placed on the shoulders of us living today. We must ensure that our children and the many generations coming after us inherit a healthy living planet. The maritime industry has a key important role to play and Singapore's maritime ecosystem has fully embraced the challenges and established, as example, the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization to help steer the change needed. This is all very exciting and positive. The Norwegian maritime cluster in Singapore is represented with high level of competence, both technologically and knowledge-wise, ready to partner with Singapore and all countries in Asia. To help drive the maritime industries towards a more sustainable tomorrow. Many of the Norwegian Business Association in Singapore's members have core focus on helping the industry become green and carbon neutral. Reach out to us at NBOS and we will connect you with the relevant members. Let me please welcome to the stage His Excellence, Norway's Ambassador to Singapore, Mr. Avon Hume. Thank you, Leo. Dear panelists and participants, it's a great privilege to get with my partners in Team Norway Singapore to welcome you to this panel discussion. In his Glasgow speech, the Norwegian Prime Minister, Mr. Støre, said that Norway's position to take a lead in low carbon solutions such as carbon capture, utilization and storage, hydrogen and electric mobility, and in ocean-based solutions such as offshore wind and green shipping, that Norway wants to develop and export new technology that can be of use beyond our borders. Norway will harness market forces and support technology to reach their tipping points. And in achieving this, he stated that correct carbon pricing is essential to get with open markets and international trade. Singapore has similar high ambitions for its green transformation, to become a global center for green finance and a regional hub for bunkering and trading of low, low carbon fuels, such as hydrogen and ammonia, to be in the forefront of maritime innovation, as demonstrated by its newly established Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization. I congratulate the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore for this initiative. And I'm pleased that the Norwegian company VW Group and DNV are among its six founding partners. On the global arena, Norway will continue to be a constructive partner in the negotiations of new emission requirements for ships in the IMO. Norway believes that zero emission shipping in 2050 must be our target, that we need to establish measures that can ensure that the target is met and a global and fair transition. Developing countries must be given opportunities and support for all of us to succeed. In Norway, zero emission shipping is growing rapidly. Batteries, hydrogen, ammonia, and biofuels have been and are being introduced in ships operating in our waters. Our first full electric ferry has been in use since 2015. By next year, we will have around 80 of them. And the world's first hydrogen fuel ferry, LMG Marine, owned by Singapore's Semcorp Marine, has done the design and installation of the hydrogen storage and fuel cells for this ferry. This has all happened because of the government's targets to cut emissions from domestic shipping and fishing by 50% by 2030. A very innovative Norwegian maritime sector and the green shipping program, established as a private-public partnership initiative by DNV in 2015. But we have experienced that substantial investments are needed from the private and the public sector. On the global scale, we need to see the same transition. Norway has a such decided to double our overall climate financing contribution by 2026 at the latest. Singapore and Norway, advanced and key maritime nations, will have to be global leaders of green and digital transformation. Through our bilateral cooperation and the joint efforts of our industries and research institutions, I'm certain 
I'm certain that we together will be able to deliver on such high ambitions. I'm looking forward to your discussion. Then I'm pleased to introduce Director Paul Kastman, Innovation Norway, Singapore. I'd like to thank my fellow Team Norway representatives, His Excellency Eivind Humme and the President of EMBAS, Leonard Stornes, for their opening remarks and extend my gratitude to our supporting partners, the Singapore Shipping Association, Eurocham, Nor Shipping, Singapore Norway Chamber of Commerce and the Norwegian Shipowners Association. Decarbonizing the maritime industry is an important pillar in Norway's ocean partnership with Singapore a partnership that stretches back to the mid-1800s and covers engagements uh, on both the government, business and research levels. Like the pandemic, climate change knows no borders and requires us to pool our competence and resources into joint efforts to solve these challenges. Now, collaborating together in innovation and research and finding joint solutions is something that Norway and Singapore do very well together. There are more than 30 MOUs between Norwegian and Singaporean research institutions and companies, as well as a large number of joint industry projects. Innovation Norway constitutes the commercial section of the Norwegian Embassy, and we work closely with all these stakeholders to facilitate increased collaboration. There have been several events organized with Team Norway throughout the year, focusing on the future of the maritime industry, such as the Singapore-Norway Innovation Conference, Singapore Maritime Week, and Ocean Now. We also organized the uh, Maritime Innovation Workshop with the MPA to address challenges facing the maritime industry at present. And next year, we are looking to continue this collaboration and we are exploring the possibility to establish a joint innovation call to fund joint industry projects. On the research side, we have worked closely with the Norwegian Research Council and the MPA to follow up the MOU they signed in year 2000. This MOU has included the joint calls for research proposals, as well as organizing the conferences MTEC and ICMAS. Looking forward, we will continue to strengthen our engagement with Singapore in the areas of decarbonization, and it's a topic we will revisit on several occasions in 2022. Now, the maritime sector has gone through substantial changes in recent years following the introduction of several disruptive technologies most notably digital technology, big data, and clean marine fuel. As a consequence, we have witnessed a lot of new opportunities and a lot of new stakeholders. Last year, we did a comprehensive stakeholder and opportunity mapping of the ocean industries in Norway and Singapore with DNV. We have followed this up with a more detailed problem statement mapping this year. And in collaboration with our maritime clusters in Norway, we are now in the process of mobilizing relevant solution providers in the areas of decarbonization and digitalization. The delegation will take place uh, in March next year. As an extension to the visit, we are aiming to establish a Norwegian maritime cluster in Singapore to follow up on these opportunities on a more regular basis. To support our increased activity level, we are also in the process of establishing a tech lab in Singapore, end of January. This will be a hub for Norwegian companies in several sectors, maritime technologies uh, being one of them. Our first event at the Tech Lab will take place in the end of January and will explore the opportunities in the maritime sector. We are looking forward to working closely with both our Norwegian and Singaporean stakeholders in bringing the maritime industry forward in these areas. Today we will hear from some of our key partners leading this development. How will their decarbonization strategies be reshaped following the COP 26. And with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, the Science and Technology Councillor of Innovation Norway in Singapore, Dr. Per Christel Lund. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Homme and uh, Leo and uh, Paul, for those uh, introductory remarks. Uh, my name is uh, Per Christel Lund. I'm a Science and Technology Councillor at the uh, Embassy here in Singapore, uh, also Innovation Norway. And I'm uh, very uh, honored and uh, very pleased to be uh, moderating a great panel today. Uh, I'd like to introduce the three panelists and then I'll uh, give the word to you to, uh, to uh, have your introductory remarks. First to my left here is uh, Christina Saenz de Santa Maria, uh, Regional Manager, Southeast uh, Asia, Pacific and India for Maritime at DNV. Uh, Christina has been uh, here for uh, a long time, four years. 15 years international experience in the maritime industry, uh, based in Spain, Portugal, Norway, 
South Africa, and now the last four years in, in this region here in Singapore. Uh, next is uh, Lynn Lowe, uh, Theodora D. and William H. Walton, uh, professor uh, of engineering, uh, presently on leave from Princeton University to lead the Global Center of Maritime Decarbonization. Uh, you're a chemical engineer by training. Uh, you have a keen interest in developing emerging solar cell technologies and macro energy systems analysis and integration. That's a mouthful. <laughs> But you bring this uh, unique perspective to augment the decarbonization efforts in the maritime uh, industry. Looking forward to that. Last, uh, Espen Paulsen, chairman of the International Chamber of Shipping, and retains executive and board membership engagement in a number of maritime companies here in Singapore and overseas. Uh, I would also like to mention that uh, last week, Espen, you um, was ranked 15th on Lloyd's list of the 100 most influential people in shipping this year. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that was the introduction. So I will give uh, the word first to you, Christina, to uh, say a bit uh, about your background and, and uh, what you bring to this, uh, to this panel. Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Per Christer. Uh, so uh, I mean, from DMV, I would like to start reflecting a little bit how our scope has widened up since we started. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, around 157 years ago. Uh, in the beginning, we were only, you know, looking at the safety of the vessel, of the asset. <coughs> but as you know, uh, time has evolved. We have changed and we have widened our scope. So basically, now we are looking more as well as the bunkering, the infrastructure, also in terms of digitalization, right? There's safety-related issues related to that. So we are putting a lot of effort on that. Uh, I'm also very proud to say that uh, we have colleagues in, uh, in our company that cover the whole energy value chain. So basically uh, the renewables, the oil and gas, and the energy management. So basically that, together with the shipping and the maritime background that we have, we are able to go where and you know, be a trusted voice in the whole decarbonization journey that uh, yeah, the world and our industry is facing. So hopefully, having all that in mind, yeah, we can have a good discussion here. Fantastic. Lynn? Thanks, for Christopher, for the introduction. And it's good to be with you, Espen and Christina. Um, I thought I would use this opportunity to introduce the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization since we're new to the ecosystem. And I think that would help contextualize our conversation. Um, so the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization, or GCMD for short, was formally established in August, um, so just three, three and a half months ago. And it was established uh, as part of a recommendation from the International Advisory Panel for Maritime Decarbonization that Esben and I actually sat on last year. Um, it's got a singular mission, and the mission is to help eliminate, uh, help the industry eliminate GHG emissions through uh, shaping standards, deploying solutions, financing projects, and fostering collaboration across sectors. We've got uh, six key industry partners um, that are our founding partners. And uh, the Maritime Port Authority of Singapore has basically matched the funding contributions from these founding partners uh, to give us a modest war chest with which we can fund pilot projects and trials so that we can lower the barrier to, uh, to, to these decarbonization solutions. Um, critical to who we are is uh, the strategic placement of the center. It's in Singapore. Uh, Singapore being the largest maritime uh, bunkering hub and the second largest cargo terminal. So this is really important to us. And uh, we add value with the other international organizations uh, that are out there. We are aligned in our mission with them. Um, we complement them and we add in our approach, in our uh, execution, and in our geography. And so by working together, I believe that we can really tackle some of the most challenging um, and most complex problems that the industry is facing. Mm. And so with the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization focusing on pilots, um, we believe that we have the unique uh, attributes to be able to do this. One is that we have the domain expertise, so we can scope out projects and identify which ones are most impactful. Uh, we're a neutral convener. We have this funding that we can actually uh, invest in asset-heavy projects, uh, putting steel on water, putting steel in the ground. And then finally, 
uh, with Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore being our partner, we have early access to regulators and regulatory authority so we can think about regula regulatory sandboxing for these pilots to happen. So looking forward to, to, to the discussion that we're going to have. Fantastic to have you here in Singapore. Espen? Thank you, Per Krista. Um, I haven't got the, quite the confidence of my two colleagues here to uh, <laughs> rattle this off from the top of my head, but thank you very much to the Norwegian Business Association for uh, inviting me here uh, today. I think this uh, session, uh, timing-wise, is very relevant. Uh, I guess the background of COP26 and more recently MEPC, that uh, both of which have been recently com completed. I think it's very clear that uh, decarbonization is uh, an absolute top priority for our industry. And I would argue that a massive shift has actually occurred over these recent years, particularly the last two years, uh, uh, as we saw very much in our shipping day at, at COP26, the ICS organized uh, so-called Shaping the Future of Shipping Day. Uh, it showed clearly that, uh, that, that there is a will to change and an alignment on the key actions needed to ensure that we can and will meet these decarbonization goals to reach net zero by 2050. But for this to take place, <coughs> our R&D uh, activity needs to step up substantially to develop the alternate fuels that we need, and we need a global market-based measure. So the MEPC, which met uh, the week before last in London, uh, to us this was what we would call a litmus test, uh, translating the lofty promises made by governments at COP26 into action. To our industry, it's very bitter disappointment. This simply did not come to pass as a discussion on our proposed US dollar 5 billion R&D uh, fund was once again deferred. Uh, this is the second time MEPC has deliberated this, uh, and we failed yet again. As industry, we spent three years cobbling together this proposal, which we announced in 2019, together with 10 fellow associations and numerous other stakeholders. We announced, as I say, the fund in 2019. Uh, I would emphasize our fund requires not a penny spent by any member state. It is entirely self-funded, yet once again, we did not get it through, despite the fact that we had some big guns behind us, Japan, uh, Singapore, Denmark, just as an example. I'm not saying that this fund is any kind of a silver bullet, but what I am saying is that it is a demonstrable effort by industry as a whole to come up with a concrete plan. So we continue to see, which we continue to see as a catalyst for research and development. We need the approval of this fund followed quickly by global levy-based carbon pricing for shipping as a way ahead. And these two must be, and I repeat, must be decisively and properly dealt with at MMPC 78 in June of 2022. All this said, uh, there is some highly encouraging support that has come to us from the Green Climate Fund, including Office of Financial Support. Furthermore, during COP26, we agreed together with the UN Global Compact, the ITF, the IMO, and the International Labour Organization to form a so-called just, just Transition Maritime Task Force. Its aim is simply to ensure that, that we are protecting workers and their communities in the drive towards decarbonization and that this is of vital importance. Finally, it is very encouraging for me to see that here in Singapore, as Lynn has referred to, we've opened, I would say in record time, this new uh, Center for Decarbonization with Lynn as the first uh, chief executive. Um, this follows the establishment in Copenhagen some time ago by uh, the Mass McKinney Center for Zero Carbon to Shipping, backed by Mask and 16 uh, individual ship owners and uh, maritime uh, service providers. Both these centers are funded by a high proportion uh, by ship owners and service providers and are to me further examples that we as an industry understand what it is we need to do and in the process quite frankly we are running more and more ahead of governments. I call it taking the law into our own hands but in a positive way. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Espen. Uh, I'd like to follow up on your, your, your points. That was actually the first discussion item we would have. And I think you re replied to some of the, of the questions. We are a couple of weeks after COP26 <coughs> and, uh, and the uh, MEPC 77 meeting that you mentioned. And if I understand you right, you and many regard this as a lost opportunity. Uh, there were uh, movements towards uh, tighter uh, regulations or emission reductions from many of the governments. This is an op that was a government uh, meeting, government organizations. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the five billion uh, uh, research fund uh, that there were uh, high expectations of but may not materialize. You seemed very disappointed of that, of course. Um, but uh, that aside, uh, you have the government on one side perhaps, and then you have the industry. Uh, for many, uh, and probably that is, is a wrong perception, but many have a, a perception that the, the maritime, the shipping industry is quite conservative. Uh, we, we, uh, it, it is, a, it is a, an old industry and they do things slowly. Uh, given the, the drive, the general drive from the COP26 uh, of a feeling of urgency, a feeling of, uh, of uh, need to do something, to, 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 that this is a real. We are beyond the discussion whether this is man-made, the climate change and all the things. We are scientific driven. Do you think that there is a, another gear now? Uh, I think you, 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 you answer that to some extent. Is there another gear of the companies, uh, the, the, the commercial part of this game, to drive forward with, the, with the, these transforma transformations that the industry would have to do? Would you like to continue your answer or should we give the word to the ladies? I, I'll quickly just yeah, say quickly, quickly. Uh, there is, in my mind, absolutely no doubt that this situation has changed radically in recent years, particularly, as I mentioned, the last two. Yeah. There is the a completely two. different mindset now right. uh, in the industry. Yeah. I think we know what we need to do. I think there is general agreement that the time for you know, sitting around and ta talking is over with, and, and, and we need... Uh, and we want action, and we want the regulations to go with it. We, we want the, the, the sooner the better. Fantastic. But we have, uh, I'm afraid to say, a growing gap between governments. On the one hand, they're ready to criticize us for apparently not doing enough. On the other hand, when we come with plans that are concrete, implementable, and, and cost-wise uh, very efficient, they somehow or other come up with all sorts of reasons not, not to do it. And that is why I say we have to basically go at our own pace. And you can see these two centers, these are just two examples yeah. of the many, many things going on around the world. Think of the number of institutes of higher learning that at this moment are, are looking into and studying and, and researching these, these issues. There's no doubt the train, as someone very wise said two years ago, is leaving or has left the station. It's just a question, are you on it or not? And in my impression is most responsible ship owners are very much on it. Lynn, what's your take on, uh, on this? Well, um, I'm new to the industry, so I come with, with a slightly different perspective. I'm um, just thinking about um, the last thing I did at Princeton was to commission this Net Zero America study where we were looking at pathways to decarbonization for the U.S. Um, to achieve net zero goals by 2050. Mm -hmm. And it was during this study that I came to appreciate how fragmented the energy system is and how fragmented the power sector is, right? I mean, they have regional regulations, forget about a national policy for electrification. That was just not possible. So um, one of the draws for which I came to GCMD was the idea that this is a global industry right. and that you are governed by a, a regulation, a, a regulation a regulator or an organization at the UN called the IMO. And so I feel like there's huge opportunity to think about global carbon regulations or global carbon policies. And to not do so would be a missed opportunity. And like has been mentioned, I mean, I think the industry wants it. The industry is signaling this. Um, so, so I think it's our responsibility to think of how we can individually and collectively nudge the IMO towards taking the leadership towards taking the leadership quickly because we don't have the luxury of time. Mm. That said, I think um, the IMO is, um, and even with policies, it's more top-down, right? Um, overseeing the whole, the whole industry. I think there are opportunities to think about bottom-up approaches too, and this is where GCMD sits, right? And so by 
thinking about the pilots that we can do in the meantime so that we can lower the barrier to eventual market adoption when the market is ready, uh, to think about the safety concerns uh, w with new fuels and whatnot. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can move things from the bottom up and perhaps the learnings from these pilot projects and these trials can then feed back to the think tanks, to the policymakers, to help them make decisions. Um, and so this is sort of how we're hoping we can contribute to, to the equation. We want to be on the train. Good. <laughs> so Christina, coming from, uh, coming from a, uh, a company that serves uh, not only the industry, but also the government, mm -hmm. uh, from class, uh, from consultancies, uh, from, from, uh, from uh, uh, design and all. Do you agree that there is kind of a, a shift that now the industry is pulling government rather than being pushed <coughs> by government? Or they are leading in this? I mean, they are on a different train or maybe in the front of the, of the train? Yeah, no, Third absolutely. Class. I think uh, industry is totally leading. But just to reflect a little bit of, you know, COP26, MEPC 77, I mean, as many aspects in life, you can see the thing, you know, uh, the, the glass half full, the glass half, uh, half empty, but at least we have a glass now. Because we didn't have a glass, you know, in shipping before. True. So now we have it. Yeah, it's yeah. in the picture for the decarbonization. Yeah. As, you know, my uh, co-panelists have said, uh, we know what to need to do. We just need to, you know, go and, uh, and be, you know, the industry uh, to lead about it, right? Uh, so, I mean, we have the... Uh, we know that full flexibility will be key, you know, in the in the future to both be competitive and compliant. Uh, we cannot forget energy efficiency because actually the cleanest energy is not energy. Yeah. So right. that's something that we need to and, and just you know uh, as hop on the plane, we on the plane on the train, <laughs> 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 and then yeah start start working together basically and as you know organizations uh, like uh, they were mentioned like Merce McKinney, the GCMD. I will talk a little bit later about the green shipping program. All those are really really powerful you know uh, organizations that I believe will really make a difference and, yeah. and, and help the industry move forward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think despite common um, belief, uh, the maritime industry actually is not the, the, the largest contributor to global CO2. It's, I don't know the percentage, you know as well. It's between three percent. Well, yeah. two and a half to three, but, yeah. But despite yeah. of that, uh, the, the, the industry has ambitious targets to reduce its footprint. Mm -hmm. We're talking 40% reduction by the next nine years. We're talking 70, or the, it was discussed, zero emission by 2050. Uh, at the same time, the industry has actually done incremental improvements continuously. They are clever of adopting uh, technology that is available. So in, you, you know all that technology. That's what you do. From now to 2030, eight years, nine years, eight years, what, what is possible to, be, to, to reach a 40% reduction of emission or carbon footprint? How can we do this? Do you, do you believe in that? Yeah, I think uh, technology is not going to be a barrier. Technology will be possible. So, I mean, we will have demonstration projects on, uh, on ships going on, uh, on ammonia and on hydrogen in 2025. And uh, we will see that maybe in, uh, our estimates in the next, uh, yeah, maybe four to eight years, we will see that they will be able to, to be done commercially. Uh, however, that alone, technology alone, is not going to solve this. Right. Right. So first of all, I mean, what we need is a regulatory reliability so that the ship owners actually can have their plans, long-term plans, and know what to invest or where to invest. There needs to be huge investments in uh, research and development and, and, and technology uh, advancements. There needs to be huge investments in infrastructure. There needs to be huge uh, investments in a mature framework to make sure that whatever new fuel we're going to use is, can be used in a safe way. And it needs to be tons and tons and tons of collaboration because that's the real fuel of the future. But the, the physical underlier is that we have to bring goods from A to B yeah. on the oceans mm. using propulsion mm. that requires energy. So you say technology is not the only thing. What are the other things? Yeah, as I, as I said, I think it's about the, the regulatory framework, right? The government needs to be there and support because you need to have a level playing field. You cannot punish the first movers and someone needs to be the first, right? So I think that that certainty on the regulatory, it's, uh, it's extremely, extremely important. Yeah. And, and as I say, afterwards, uh, depending on, on, on the profile of each of the ship owners, uh, but again, it's not only about the ship owners, about is the ports, is the shipyards, is the cargo owners, is the financiers, 
everyone needs to move in the right direction because otherwise uh, we will not make it work and yeah. someone will lose and yeah. that's not what we want. And so. you mentioned pilots, uh, you mentioned demonstration projects and of course they have to be done in an in a international collaborative environment and that's Absolutely. what you're doing Lynn. Yeah, um, I mean, I feel the same way um, with Christina. So she, she summarized it very well. I mean, I, I don't think we need new science. I don't think we need new physics. Um, but we do need new, um, there are, that said, there are significant barriers uh, to getting there. I mean, there are technological barriers because you need to take the science that's at the bench to uh, implement it and integrate it in the environment and then to worry about scale up, right? So, so the solutions need to be available at the right cost, at the right scale, and that's the challenge. Our energy infrastructure as we know it took more than a century to build. Mm. And now we're talking about a transition in three decades and you're talking nine years, right? And so, so it's a monumental challenge um, that, that, that we need to tackle. And, and so beyond technology development, there are regulatory barriers, there are financial barriers uh, that we need to think about. I'll just give you an example. I mean, we all talk about uh, new fuels simply because you need the new fuels to be able to reach the targets that we're talking about uh, for the maritime sector because uh, propulsion uses fuels and that currently produces carbon dioxide. Um, of all the new fuels, you need green hydrogen. Where do you get green hydrogen from? You need green electrons. We talk as though green hydrogen is available today, mm. but it's not. Mm. Uh, just again, as a frame of reference, right? Um, there are probably about 200 gigawatts equivalent of green hydrogen projects in the pipeline. So this, this is an ambition in the pipeline. If you look across the world and you say, well, if I look at electrolyzer, electrolysis to split water to generate hydrogen, how many of those projects out there? That's about 200 megawatts equivalent, so three orders of magnitude below that. And then if you really then ask, what about the green hydrogen? Because this 200 megawatts are not all green hydrogen, right? The biggest green hydrogen project that I know of is the one in Quebec. It's powered by hydropower. That's 20 megawatts. So mm. we are 10,000 times beneath what we need to be, and that's just talking about the green hydrogen that's in the pipeline. So the scale is important, but then we're sort of compressed by the timeline. So it's an all hands on deck moment that we really need to come together and work together. And we need all expertise around the table to be able to get us there. So Espen, you, your, your chamber represents what is 80% of the world tonnage or, or the market as such. Uh, from all these companies that you're dealing with or, or interacting with, is there a consensus uh, among them more or less that it's possible to reach this target or are some of them thinking that it, it can't be done or someone is you know pushing forward or what, what's what's your take on this yeah. I, I mean I think largely there's a consensus but there are certainly no. uh, you know there are certainly some that, that that do for technical reasons particularly have have doubts um, and, and and that's understandable because it, it you know for the reason we've just heard you know the, the hurdles and the obstacles are many, but I think largely there, there, there is uh, agreement. And I think also what people forget is that there, there are the here and now measures between now and 2023, yeah. the EEX, EEXI and, and similar initiatives, you know, they are, they are bearing fruit. They're not very sexy. They're not very, you know, glamorous or publicized or known about. But you know, you go into a ship owner's office and you, you talk to a ship owner and you realize how much effort goes on kind of behind the scenes in trying to make these incremental changes. And if you add up the, you know, the, the bottom panes, the hull shapes, the engine types, the, uh, now the bubbles underwater, the, the propeller pitches, and you know, there are many, many things uh, uh, on, on deck. I mean, on, on uh, row rows, for example, there are, Rows being built with with very large solar panels, so that when they're in port, that you there's no zero emissions in port. It's entirely run off um, solar power. So you know there there is a lot going on, yes. uh, tremendous amount going on. Much of which is the here and now, as opposed to the the bigger picture, which is certainly also very much going but, on. But these things that you mention is is incremental improvement. They, they are. It has been they, going on for some time. Uh, absolutely. So we're talking a few percent here and there. Yes, what, but but what, it's but I still think that it's that, that you know the fleet that we have we're going to have this fleet yes. for a long time. Exactly. And therefore we must 
make it as efficient as humanly possible. Yeah. And there are things going on. I mean, carbon capture we were talking yes. about. And we're, you know, there, there are things going on that may help the existing fleet sort of um, carry on and, and uh, in the least damaging way yeah. uh, possible whilst the, uh, the, the greater goals are being uh, worked towards. Can I just add to that? I think, I mean, I think change is uncomfortable. We, the status quo is easy. Change is always going to be uncomfortable, mm. especially when you don't know what you're changing towards. Yes. Mm. And so I think to the extent that, um, speaking for GCMD, to the extent that we can assuage people of the, you know, the fears that are associated with change, I think that's a good thing. So I'll give you another example. I think, you know, when we talk about ammonia, the first thing that comes to mind that people talk about is, oh, it's really toxic. I agree, it's really toxic. So I think um, one thing GCMD is doing is to, to kind of address the safety concerns about using ammonia as a bunkering fuel. Um, you know, just like I take inspiration from the chemical industry. Look at chlorine gas. It's a super, super toxic gas but the chemical industry figured out how to use it and handle it safely. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We look at silane in the microelectronics industry. Once they figured out how to handle silane um, properly, it revolutionized the microelectronics industry. So I believe figuring out how to handle ammonia safely as a bunker fuel yeah. is the responsibility of this industry and we're taking the lead in trying to figure that out and perhaps with the safety and the operations envelopes defined, um, we can kind of show that you can do this safely, and I think that goes a long way towards even piloting and, and whatnot. But, but that safety piece is, is an important Critical. piece to, to, to kind of assuage people that this, is, this can happen. Oh, I agree. I mean, the, the perception of safety is also a subjective mm. uh, Absolutely. Affair. Uh, hydrogen, for example, that has yeah. that reputation of the Hindenburg thing. Or nuclear. But, but just, <laughs> or nuclear for that yeah. case. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. But, but, but I'm thinking it's, it's, it's also, I mean, one of the most dangerous chemicals that we are uh, handling, at least the, the energy densest chemical, is gasoline for your car. Mm -hmm. And how is that handled? Mm -hmm. With the buckets of, pl of or plastic buckets, and everybody can charge or fill or all these things. You know, so so it's, it, I think it's a very subjective matter yeah. as well. Yeah. So, so the work that you're doing of demystifying the toxicity of ammonia, for example, mm. Mm. or the explosiveness of hydrogen, mm. or even nuclear, although that should be another panel, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm thinking one other thing. We're talking about, okay, you're talking about the, the regulations, which is a push. Uh, we're talking about uh, transformative new fuels, which is, has a cost element to it. Uh, improvements or, um, or, or incremental improvements is also have a cost element to it. So everything seems to be, uh, you mentioned burden, uh, economic burden, uh, technology uh, uh, implementation burdens. Is there a positive side to that? Would green shippers have a competitive advantage if they are first movers? Is, could, could we twist it around a bit to make it, it also a positive pull instead of a governmental or, or, or regulatory push? Mm. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think so. But uh, again, then it needs the whole value chain involved. So it, need, it, it needs the cargo owners and the financiers to incentivize yeah, sure. that because it's the ship owner's customers, right? Yes, yes. So it has to, the whole value chain needs to move in the right direction yeah. or in the same direction, I would say. And, uh, and then we can get that, you know, green circular economy. Uh, per se, uh, that uh, that it doesn't punish the the first movers. Yeah, uh, that's Yeah, I I, I think um, if you talk to the container companies, there's no doubt that they are all feeling and and experiencing pressure from the, their customers. I mean, with the IKEAs and the WalMarts and so on of this world, they in turn have their uh, constituents to answer to, and they they want this to happen. The, the mute point is always, well, are they prepared to pay? Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, you know, That's right. it, 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 it the, the, you know, again, the, it, it, it's, it, this is the direction of travel and, yeah. and yeah. it's happening more and more and more. And I think I agree with Christina. It's very important that the major first movers who are investing hugely in these various technologies are not punished or disadvantaged for it. Equally, I think it is also very important to remember, as I mentioned in my remarks, that the, you know, the developing world, uh, you, you know, th th there's a huge cost to them, and we have to make sure that that, in greening and going this route, that they are not um, 
too badly disadvantaged. We have to be very aware of this fact yeah. uh, and take that into the equation. Mm -hmm. okay. And fundamentally, I think, you know, it's a circular argument, right? Yes, I mean, I think you, mm. uh, and so. until, until car there's a price on carbon. There we go. Until there's a price on carbon, exactly. it's always going to be the circular argument yeah, yes. because we're um, we're not internalizing the price of carbon. We're yeah, not yeah. internalizing the cost right. that that we're we're imposing on our environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to ask about the the, the the price of carbon, the mm -hmm. carbon trading schemes, mm -hmm. uh, carbon uh, taxes, uh, quotas, and these kind of things. Let's say that uh, it, 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 we come to some kind of consensus. We tried a few times the Paris. COP19, uh, I think it was, and everything, to have a global uh, scheme for at least price, pricing carbon. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it would give a, a boost to technology development. It would be a boost for everyone that avoids the carbon emission and all the things. Uh, how important would this be to reach the 2030 target, you think? Can we do it without that? I don't think so. No. I don't think. No. I, think I think you need the technical and operational requirements, and that's and like the that EXI incentive. and CI, and then the market-based mechanism. Exactly. And then, of exactly. course, what it should mm. be at mm. what uh, you know, level price, that's another thing. But, but I think you need the combination of both things to really you know, pull in a direction. So how much did you t discuss the carbon uh, pricing in the MTEC uh, meeting? Uh, <laughs> Not um, I, I, carbon pricing is certainly a, a, a you know a very very big subject and and I know I talked to a number of ship owners who are uh, looking into it and and probably going to invest in in, in companies that can that can assist in this process yeah. because it is it is as Christina says without doubt coming I think from industry point of view we accept this we just prefer what we call the bunker levy scheme which is simply you know charging on per ton, per ton consumed across the board for everybody so that it's right. global. What, is, what we fear uh, is happening is the EU already uh, yes. looking like they'll go on their own and, and create uh, an, an, a non-level playing field, which is something that we, we you know, it's a subject in itself, which I, I mean, we've heard this term a thousand times, but it, it is very important for shipping's overall point of view. We saw in the, in the EU some years ago when the airline industry were told you have to do, do this and that, then India, China, and US said, well, that's fine, we just won't fly to Europe any yeah. longer, and then miraculously the whole thing disappeared. I don't think that that's gonna happen in this case because I think common sense will ultimately prevail. But again, this is, this is IMO, we're ready. Let, you know, let's do it, but, but in MAPC 78 in June ne next year, that's the time. Let's uh, talk a bit about international collaboration. Lin, you, you, of course, your center is designed or, or created for that purpose. But if we go a little bit more uh, Singapore, Norway focus, uh, Christine, I will ask you, you have a foot in, uh, in many places, or oh, that would be many feet, but at least Norway <laughs> and Singapore. No, I do <laughs> Can you give us an example of, of a successful collaboration or at least perhaps experience and knowledge transfer between the two countries? I mean, Norway and Singapore are, we are small countries in population uh, size perhaps, but we are, I would claim we are pretty big in the maritime and, and, uh, and uh, shipping uh, world. Mm -hmm. So, so how do we collaborate? Uh, no, absolutely, and I think there's, as you say, many, many similarities in, you know, it's two very important maritime hubs, and I think that uh, in, in both cases also uh, uh, the, the, um, the governments, uh, you know, uh, know that the maritime industry is, is, is important and they try to, to support, an uh, in, in example of the GCMD being, in a way, MPA, part of it, right? Uh, so, uh, so that's very good. And, uh, and for example, if, if I talk about the green shipping program, yes, right? Yes. Which is um, something that was established in 2015, we were also a founding partner. And uh, it has been really uh, inspiring to see it developed because it started with like 15 partners, two ministries, and right now it's 95 partners. Mm. Uh, we are talking about uh, 35 pilots that have been done. Uh, and uh, out of those, 11 of them are actually, you know, realizing and mm -hmm. under, you know, construction. So I think this is really good. And one of the things that is very interesting to, to see is that in the beginning, you know, the pilots were just focused on new fuels, right, new technologies. But then we saw that, no, we need to look broader. And then the pilots started uh, looking at the ports, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And then the cargo owners came in. And, and then the financiers came in, and actually now we have pilots in all those aspects. So technology is just one of it, 
but is that the infrastructure is your cargo owners, is that circular economy. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is that it has like a ripple effect. So all of a sudden it's really popular. Everyone wants to be part of it and not those pilots that can actually help their respective, um, how do you say, companies. Right uh, and uh, and the industry moving uh, moving forward right so uh, but it's about you know piloting 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 and scaling you identify quickly the barriers you work on them and uh, yeah you make the studies and uh, yeah you you work together and that private um, public partnership it's it has proven really good and that's why we are very excited about GCMD because mm -hmm. it's very similar right uh, so we're seeing similar things as well I yeah mean, exactly. Uh, we've only been around for three months and we issued our first uh, call for proposal to look at safety envelopes and operation envelopes for ammonia bunkering and uh, with that issue we brought together industry partners and we've got more than 20 across the supply chain who've signed letters of collaboration, who've signed NDA, willing to share data with us, share proprietary information and their experience with us. And then we've got another 30 plus companies who have joined this uh, industry consultation and alignment panel who are going to provide feedback once the study is done. So, I mean, we're seeing great feedback from the industry and they want to be involved. And so I think, you know, for GCMD to, to be able to play the role of convening everybody and to scope out the project and curate the project, it's tremendous. Mm. I think uh, to add to that, it, it's, um, this benefits the smaller owner tremendously because smaller owners do not just don't have the capacity or the wherewithal to 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 investigate, assess, and analyze the numerous things that are uh, initiatives that are happening. And so, I must say, when we were doing this, uh, the center in in Singapore, where there was a lot of discussion about the great great need to collaborate and to avoid duplication mm -hmm. with other centers. And and I, I for one think this is really important. People need to leave their egos at the door and just yeah. focus on what this is really all about. Some of it, which is commercial and has a great value, fine. That, 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 I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this, the stuff that would apply universally and can benefit the, the industry universally. Secondly, the, the ownership. You have to bear in mind 60, 70 percent of the world's ship owners are, are small, and by small I mean under 20 ships. Yeah. The great thing with these types of owners is that in many cases they are highly entrepreneurial and they were, I can give you umpteen examples. When I started in shipping 50 years ago, a company called Thenamaras had one ship. Today that family has three large companies with huge fleets mm. in, you know, in 50 years. They started by, with one ship 50 years ago and there are many such examples. But my point is that these small owners, the entrepreneurial owners, will benefit tremendously from this. Uh, whereas the big guns, uh, you know, they have the budgets and particularly in the container segment, they're m making the money these days <laughs> whereby they can really do donate some, some serious resources to this issue, right? Yeah. yeah, and collaboration happens more than just within the sector. I mean, uh, so for me, when I think about collaboration, I think about multiple ways of collaborating with lots of people around the table. So, you know, I can speak to collaboration with the other decarbonization centers across the world. So, for example, with the Merce McKinney Muller, Zero Carbon Shipping Center, um, we're very aligned in our mission, but our approach is very different. I think their approach is more top-down. They're more focused on policy, on strategy, um, on looking at pathways that the industry can take, whereas we're more bottom-up and we're focused on sort of the local constraints, doing pilots so that we can, we can fail fast and learn faster mm, yes. and translate that learning into something uh, more meaningful into an action. And so we see that we can collaborate with each other because we can take guides and cues from their report. Mm. But then we can also, with our learnings, feed it back to their, their analysis to refine their pathways, right? So mm. there are natural collaborations across the board. We see collaboration, um, we see people eager to collaborate across sectors as well. Mm. And I'll just mention too, um, fuel producers. Yes. Um, I think it totally makes sense to collaborate with them because, I mean, at the end of the day, they're the ones producing the fuel, but they're also interested in pivoting because they're going through this energy transition. Their scope one, or our scope one is their scope three, right? Um, so, so they're thinking about carbon capture. And so if they do carbon capture, for example, there are lots of conversations about using Singapore as a carbon capture hub. And if Singapore becomes a carbon capture hub, where are you going to store all that carbon? 
you're going to need ships involved to transport the carbon dioxide around. And so we can play an important role in that conversation in the ecosystem. The other example I would bring up is aviation. You had asked earlier on how much our emissions uh, are, and our emissions is about 3%. Aviation's emissions is about 3%. Mm. They see a lot of the similar challenges and opportunities we do. Um, and so I think there are huge opportunities to collaborate, if for nothing, to avoid duplication, mm. to build common infrastructure um, that we can reduce costs. Um, so yeah. Mm. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, uh, this, these centers and these, uh, these uh, initiatives and the one are benefiting the smaller companies as well. The uh, shipping industry is a highly competitive industry. Uh, and it's, uh, when it comes to technology, um, how can I say, uh, availability or savviness, it's, it, it's a huge differences around the world. Uh, for your centers or for the activities that you're, 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 you're talked about the, the, the Green Coastal uh, Program of Norway and your centers. Dissemination of information, sharing the information, or making it available mm -hmm. for everyone uh, in a such a comp highly competitive industry. How do you, how do you handle that? Um, or, our or philosophy, is, it a, is it not a problem? Our, our philosophy is that we are doing good for the industry. Yes. And so to the extent possible, it's open access. For sure, the safety studies are going to be open access. Yes, yes. And then the pilots uh, are pre-competitive, right? So there will be open access. I think the, the, ki the projects where I imagine IP may be involved is sort of background IP that solution providers bring in. There, then we kind of have to negotiate up front how we can do this in the most open way possible mm. so that we can benefit the industry. Because that, after all, is why we're here, our founding partners provided the funds so that we can benefit the industry, mm. right? So, so open access and being transparent and being able to share is a critical part to what we do. Mm. Was that the philosophy behind Absolutely. the Green uh, Coastal Program? Exactly well? the same. Exactly the same. So whatever can be shared is shared. Of course, the commercial and the IP things, those not. But uh, yeah, it's for the industry. And one of the, th the things that also uh, we, we think is good with the Green Shipping Program is actually, you know, is, is um, uh, source shipping, which is kind of a good Test bed Very for the deep sea shipping, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. So that's yeah. also you know looking yeah. at those angles. It's a, yeah, good combination, and we can help each other. And it's the companies that you're representing see the same way? Yes, mm -hmm. I, I think I think that, that you know I think there's a lot of support for an, an interest in these, and, and as we've discussed, I mean some owners have put up very very large amounts of money. In the case of Mers, about 16 companies here, six, but but doubled up with the MPA. I mean. Okay, the amounts in, in absolute terms, in terms of what you need to do, you could say are not are not big, but but I would say the speed with which this was agreed and implemented is still pretty amazing. It's mm -hmm. four short months from the time when the report was submitted to mm -hmm. when the center was formally established. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it 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 was really fast. Mm -hmm. uh, Back or, or further on the center when they come to the funding and how the funding can be used. My experience, uh, having been, been in Singapore for, for quite a few years, working in research and uh, mm. you know other things, uh, is that uh, it's not easy for foreigners to plug into programs in Singapore and kind of channel money out of Singapore. Put sure. it very bluntly. Yeah. Uh, your your center is by nature global. Yes. Uh, which means you should also fund or help fund the projects outside of Singapore. Yep. While it's, is it 50% funded by MPA-ish? 50-ish? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, 50%. So that means you do have a bit of flex to uh, also initiate and run projects outside of Singapore. Yes, yes, we do. I mean, and that's why I, 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 I love the way how GCMD was constructed. It was very thoughtful how the funds were pulled together because we can precisely fund projects that are outside Singapore. But let me say that there are good reasons why we want to do the projects in Singapore. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's aligned with the national interest, so we can really leverage uh, 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 that opportunity. But Singapore as an island is so population dense. Yes. Its port sees more than a thousand ships at any given time. And so if we can do, a, especially a bunkering infrastructure project, if it's successful here and we can define the safety envelopes for it to be successful in Singapore, chances are it's extensible elsewhere, right, because of the stringent safety requirements. So there are good strategic reasons why we would want to do these kinds of projects here in Singapore. Mm -hmm. 
We have uh, just a few minutes left, uh, uh, so I would ask you to, to have some final comments and maybe I'm still thinking, is it possible to reach these targets? And, and uh, I feel much more confident now, Christina, that you say that it is. Because you're the, you're the one that knows, uh, all of you, of course. I would say don't quote me, but I think it's too well, it's, late. It's on the air already, so. <laughs> no, it's, no, it's on you. I'm kidding. Uh, so, so and, and you talked about regulation. Uh, you talked about, uh, Lynn, you talked about the, the, the pilots and actually from uh, technology, actually showing that it works. And you talk about how you can engage uh, the, the industry, that the industry is actually going ahead of government. So, so what do we need now? What, what's your final thinking? What, what, are, we, what are we going to do tomorrow, uh, next year, and then 20, uh, what is it, 2029, 20, the year before, we have to reach this 40% target? Mm. Yeah, no, I would say, you know, decarbonization is a team sport. It's not a race. <laughs> so it's really no competition. There's no one single company government country that has the monopoly of good ideas so we just need to you know pull up uh, our sleeves and start working now and uh, yeah make it happen which you could conti just continue the good work absolutely Lynn. I would continue with that theme I mean I think we, we've seen a fundamental paradigm shift in our discourse on climate change right I mean there, no one's talking about whether it's anthropogenic anymore yes, yes, um, exactly. because of all the weather events Beyond that have that happened. Um, and, and it went from that to yep. talking about temperature, right? Yep. One and a half to two degrees. And then now to talking about carbon budgets and with companies, nations, corporations now declaring net zero ambition. And I was very heartened to see at COP26, um, what was it? Um, that if you add up, okay, they're not binding, but if you add up all the declarations, that amounts to over 90% of the carbon emissions. Yes. So there's no shortage of ambition, yes. no mm -hmm. shortage of declaration. Now the question is how do we channel all that enthusiasm and all that energy, no pun intended, into action? Mm. And so I think GCMB, GCMD is doing its bit uh, by piloting projects, by shaping standards. And so I would just invite everybody to come join us, you know, be a part of us, learn about what we're doing and, and join our journey. Yes, but now you as optimistic? I, as, I am. Uh, I'm completely optimistic because the momentum has, has shifted, as I said at the, right at the outset. I, I think that it, it, this is happening. And I was very pleased to see former Secretary of State John Kerry saying that um, never underestimate the in ingenuity of mankind mm. because I've actually said this myself, not that I'm a copycat or he is in any way, but, <laughs> but probably him. But, <laughs> but the point is still do not underestimate the ingenuity of mankind because it, 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 you know, there's, there's things that we cannot see today. I, I agree with you that 2040, you know, it, it sounds pretty tough, right? Yeah. 2030 and 40, it sounds tough. But I, I do believe we'll get there. And yeah. I can't tell you precisely why, except that my gut tells me we will. <laughs> very, very good. Scientific. I think that is, uh, we, can, we can end on this uh, optimistic note. Uh, mm -hmm. There is, uh, it's, it's doable if we mm -hmm. do the right thing. Uh, we just have to find a, a way to do it. And I think like the initiatives, like the, the Global Center for, for Maritime Decommunization are the initiatives that are, that are definitely the, the one, some of the instruments we have to do. Uh, and, and I believe also that, uh, that collaboration between the leading countries, uh, which do have sharing the same ambition, sharing the, the same uh, feeling of urgency. Mm. Uh, we are technology savvy. Mm. Uh, we, we, we can translate, I believe, talk into action. And, and together we can, uh, we can reach this target. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>